of our uh, presentation, we will have uh, we will hear from our speakers on uh, gender issues in education. Um, and for our first speaker, he will be discussing about the wage gap between. Sorry. He will be talking about. Uh, the title is Outward and Upward They Go, A Look into the Educational Mobility of Men and Women and the Schooling Progression of Boys and Girls. And our presenter is Dr. Lawrence Dacoypoy, who is a full professor at the, at the uh, De La Salle University School of Economics. Sasabihin ko dapat yung School of Economics He was the dean of the school from 2013 to 2015 and currently sits as a member of the Commission in Higher Education's Technical Committee for Economics. Well, he has a long list of achievements, and I just want to highlight that in 2009, he was one of the recipients of the National Academy of Science and Technology's Outstanding Young Scientist Award for, for Economics. And he was also a recipient of the NAS Outstanding Scientific Paper Award for his research on wage functional analysis. And uh, he is the other half of our GAD uh, point person, Dr. Connie Dakoy. Friends, I now give you Dr. Lawrence Dakoy. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, it's an honor to be here. This is my first time to present before a distinguished uh, set of uh, distinguished audience. Well, um, my, my wife should be the one presenting this one because <laughs> <laughs> she generated a lot of, a lot of insights. Uh, and uh, the title uh, entirely uh, was uh, her idea. <laughs> so I will just do the presenting. So this is uh, essentially a paper that, uh, it's a simple one because uh, it delves into the empirical aspects of uh, uh, capturing uh, intergenerational education elasticity. So it's a very technical term, but then <coughs> in GIS, it's just essentially how to uh, place yourself or oneself relative to the achievements of your parents. OK, so let me begin. OK, so what are the motivations? So the first one is that we are always mindful of intergenerational priorities. So we always know that the state of educational attainment of our children relative to what we've achieved acts as a useful indicator of mobility along the social status ladder. So uh, to what extent is this being appreciated, especially by our policymakers? I know that in the household, a lot of us uh, really want the best uh, outcomes for our children. The second one is that there's this observation that the gender gap has already been reversed. So current global and local trends in education, for instance, show that boys have consistently underperformed in the academic front. But should we still worry about it? Okay. The third one is that it's on measurement and heterogeneity. So in the paper, we've, we did our best given the limited uh, data constraints or the data constraints that we observed. Uh, established methodology to polish understanding of heterogeneity, which means that different outcomes depend on different circumstances. And of course, appreciate uh, practical data constraints. So the question here is that could we still generate meaningful evidence? And the last one is, I, I guess, uh, for those, those of you who are into policy, so social mobility is a long-run concept. So not a lot of people appreciate it in the short run. So if you're a policymaker, would it be nice that starting now, uh, should you be orient your policies toward uh, the long run? So it's a big question because uh, of the short electoral cycle, for instance. Okay, so what are the paper's objectives? So there are three. Uh, the first one is that we all recognize the importance of education, but do we understand how parental education attainment has affected children's educational outcomes? Okay, and this may be important because uh, when we provide uh, policy prescriptions, we pay attention to the target and timing of interventions, the structure of programs, and other educational initiatives. The second one is that uh, if you take a look at the literature, you'll find out that 
a lot of these studies have already been done exploring the de gender dimensions of education, but then I think uh, they use data sets that are of limited scope. So in this paper, we use, and uh, this addresses the third one, we use the census of population in order to generate a gen uh, regional perspective on, on the gender dimension of educational mobility. Okay, so what are the two questions? So in the paper, there are two components. The first one, it tries to measure the uh, effects of paternal and maternal education on sons and daughters' educational attainment. So the key questions are, how do we empirically characterize educational mobility in the Philippines? And the second is, are daughters more educationally mobile relative to their parents? What about the sons? And uh, do we observe robust regional patterns across cohorts? The second one has something to do with the schooling progression, and this is really connected to the concept of educational mobility. So we look into three states. The first is the child is delayed. The second is he's on time, or she's on time. And the last one is she's relatively advanced well, uh, to him. He's advanced relative to his age. So the key questions are, what are the respective impacts of paternal and maternal education on schooling progression? The second is, uh, how will the mother's employment status affect progression outcomes? Because we all know that, uh, that mothers, if they are labor force participants, they also play a big role in shaping uh, household outcomes. So for instance, after, uh, um, after work hours, they still spend a lot of time teaching their, their children or preparing their children for, for school the next day. And the third one is still, no? we focus on the regional patterns. OK, so we found ample literature support. And I will just only focus on the, the uh, important ones. OK, so essentially in the literature, you'll find studies that provide ample characterization uh, of the educational gap, OK? And uh, there's this excellent study by Bevis and Barrett. And then what they examined is the intergenerational income elasticity. elasticity. So they dealt with elas the, the household income. In our case, we're dealing with education, educational outcomes. So the, their data, though limited in scope, was so rich that they were able to decompose the sources of intergenerational income elasticity. And there, there are other studies, notably by Yamauchi and Chonko, Yamauchi and Liu, and Estudillo et al., which also focus on the educational outcomes. So the, as a, an econometric technique, we found that uh, Lansona, although he only focuses his study on the uh, Beacon, using the Beacon we were based in data set, I think he's the first one who examined educational or measured educational elasticity. OK, so now we go to two trends. So Narayan et al. Uh, document the following global trends. So girls in high income economies exhibit high, higher rates of tertiary education, a trend that is also observed in the developing world. You know? In absolute terms, intergenerational educational mobility is higher for girls than boys. In relative terms, Daughters with highly educated parents are more likely than sons to be in the top quartile in terms of educational attainment. And this, this, uh, this graph simply shows, or this is based on the 2010 CPH. Uh, it simply shows that the results are robust across cohorts. So in terms of average educational attainment, uh, females dominate. Okay. The second one is just to provide the, the context, okay, this, uh, although they are not directly used uh, in the econometric investigation, uh, this simply shows the disparities in terms of regional growth, okay? And then, based on the CPH, you can easily measure the mean educational attainment of daughters by cohort. And then, if, you, if you're going to take a look at it, so the, the, the results, bounded by the yellow yellow line, okay, those pertain to Luzon regions, Luzon-based regions. Those bounded by green, they pertain to Visayan regions, and then the, the blue uh, bounded, uh, the 
the last one, the sun, <coughs> Mindanao. And then if you take a look, for instance, if you take a look at NCR, the mean estimates are close to each other. And then for CAR, relative to CAR, although CAR registers a high, high mean as far as the 1980 to 84 cohort is concerned, the dispersion is quite large. Now for SANS, take a closer look, the highest, is, m highest mean is registered by NCR or is found in NCR, that's 12 years. But then if you take a look at CAR, the latest, the most recent cohort, the blue one, um, is just eight. So there's this, uh, a differential of four relative to NCR in terms of mean. Okay, and then if you take a, examine the, the variance, the degree of variability associated with ARM, uh, they're closer to each other, okay? And this one uh, simply compares the, the respective means associated <coughs> with boys and girls' education. So it's negative because the, as, I, as I mentioned, females dominate as far as education attainment is concerned. Uh, pay close attention to NCR, for instance. Okay, that's, yeah, you, you saw NCR. And there's a small rectangular, uh, rectangle there that's associated with the variance of NCR. So it measures the, the variance of the difference, respective differences of the uh, cohort means. And then it's quite small. And then the, the competitor of that is, if in, is Karaka. Okay, and uh, we don't know the reason why. Okay, and if you take a look at uh, ARMM, for instance, the blue one, the blue dot, is very close to zero. So there's this, the mean education of, of the latest cohort of boys is almost equal to the mean education of the latest cohort of girls. Okay, so those are the disparities that we've observed. Okay, so what, what did we do? So this, <coughs> it's an econometric investigation and it's uh, conditional on the attributes of the members of the household or the, the boys and then the girls. And then we followed Lansona in the sense that we tried to capture the impact of the schooling outcomes associated with parents. Okay, so in that, in that case, so you essentially have two equations. The second one is just a mere, uh, in, uh, it Im merely improves the first one by adding more variables. Okay, so what are the variables that we, we control? Number of children, extended household indicator, household size, the presence of overseas Filipino worker, household head. And then we impose the age restriction uh, 25 and above. Okay, so if you're going to examine the, the responsiveness of the schooling outcome associated with boys and girls, all you need to, to do is to understand how intergenerational education mobility is measured is to take a look at the coefficient. It's a very broad measure. So uh, it's a caveat. there's a caveat. It's a very broad measure because there are several improvements or measures that can still improve the efficiency of the said parameter. But then the intergenerational education elasticity is just a correlation measure. It's not a causal measure, So which means that you're just, uh, if it goes up, then there's no assurance that because the coefficient is positive, it doesn't mean that it will cause, it will result in an increase, okay? So there are other, there are a lot of inter intervening factors that may uh, result in, an, uh, in a different outcome. So a high value, so implies high persistence, and a low value, which means that it's close to zero, implies, uh, low persistence. And in terms of capturing mobility effects, we always favor a relatively lower value because that would mean that the schooling outcome achieved by the boy or the girl is less correlated with the schooling outcome achieved by the parents. Okay, so here are just mobility estimates. So there's a table that we uh, constructed in order to summarize the said estimates, that, but let me just focus on the mobility maps that simply reflect the 
intergenerational elasticity, educational elasticity estimates. Okay, so for instance, there are just two cohorts that we consider the oldest and then the, the youngest cohort. And then the, the usual triangle indicates that there is upward mobility. So from darker color, it went down, no? It went down, so it means that uh, based on the data, okay, uh, sons in car experience higher mobility in uh, the 1980-1984 cohort relative to the older cohort. Okay, and then you can also see central Luzon registering an improvement uh, and central Visayas as well. The second one is that it pertains to mother son pairs. So if you have the regression, just recover the parameter estimate associated with mother's schooling years. Okay, and then uh, you're going to put them in, in, the, uh, in the map. And then what you can see is that in car, there is this, uh, uh, there's this relative immobility from blue to mass. Uh, it increased to uh, one point to the to a value within three and uh, point three and point three five, and then if you take a look at daughters, uh, this is where it uh, well it's going to be a bit exciting because all of them uh, you, you just observe on the uh, on the right you will see you know blue shades of blue, and then the blue are the blue color is usually associated with. Uh, higher mobility. That's for daughters, father-daughter peers. And in the literature, there's always a case mm -hmm. that uh, in some studies, uh, it has been established that the father exerts a considerable influence on the schooling outcomes of daughters, not only daughters, but boys as well. And then this one, okay, it, uh, it's not as, well, it's still relatively, um, it paints a relatively good picture, and then, but then you're talking about mother-daughter mother-daughter pairs. Then if you take a look at the, the Mindanao region, <coughs> there are regions there that, regis, that didn't change, that, regi, that um, registered no change in mobility. Okay? So the, that's the first one. The, first, the second half is that we talk about uh, schooling progressions. And again, it's a relatively, we use a relatively simple technique. So if you have schooling progressions, it means that the outcome of interest is ordered, so on time. Delayed is uh, the, the least desirable outcome, delayed on time and then advanced relative to the age. Okay, so this is just the mechanism that we use in order to uh, um, implement the ordered profit model. Okay, so in the paper, there are several, several charts that have been uh, reproduced. Okay, so let me just focus on this. So if the mother's educational attainment is at most elementary, and then as you can see, um, you have two outcomes there, working and non-working. So we just focus on, let's say, the probability that the child will be in an advanced progression state. Okay, so that's the X, those are the Xs. And then as you can see, if, if you're only considering uh, girls with, uh, or with mothers, <coughs> whose educational attainment is at most elementary, you'll find out that the probability associated with the working, with the labor, uh, with the with work, working mothers is higher than those who don't, who don't work. Okay, and then uh, for college graduate, the probability of being in an advanced state is much higher, of course. It's something that we expect. And then uh, we also use the, the maps in, in order to capture regional variation. So the estimated probability that a sun is in advanced state, so the one to the left, you, uh, you have the case of working less educated mothers, and then to the right, you have well-educated mothers. So the probability of being in an advanced state is much higher. Okay, and then in here, you have uh, a comparison between non-working less educated mothers and non-working college educated mothers. So it's, uh, it replicates the previous exercise. But then for, uh, but this one estimated probability sun, you're considering college educated non-working mothers and college educated working mothers. 
okay, uh, when they're working, the outcomes are, are much better. Okay, so let me just uh, quickly go to the next one. So this one, daughter's progression, uh, low human capital and labor force participation status, the probability estimates are much higher than those associated with SANS. Okay, and, when, and then when you talk about college graduates, of course, uh, the probabilities are also relatively higher. And these are just some maps. So the blue one, if you, you observe that, okay, it's dominated by the blue color, it means that uh, the probabilities associated with a daughter being in the advanced progression state is very high across regions. Okay, and then you still observe the blue, so it's still okay, okay, to the right. Okay, and this one, okay, you talk about college educated and college who are working and then working, so the med uh, darker yung, yung shade ng blue, so which means that uh, higher probability. Okay. okay, but then if you consider low educated working and non-working mothers, of course the probabilities are not that high anymore. Okay, okay, this one. So, estimated probability that the child is in advanced progression state. To the, le to the left, you'll find daughters, and to the right, sons. The darker you blue D to the left. Okay, so which means that it, it merely confirms the statistical characterization that we made earlier. Okay, but then if you take a look at low educated mothers, okay, so lighter naman yung shade dito sa left, so which means that daughters are still in an advantageous position. Okay, so uh, last three slides. So what are the takeaways? It's a simple empirical characterization of educational outcomes. Simple in the sense that we're, we were really constrained by the availability of information found in the CPH. But then here are the takeaways. First, uh, while the gender gap in educational attainment has been reversed, boys' educational performance must improve, okay? The second one is that maternal education, similar to what have been two results in the literature, is important in children's schooling progression outcomes. But then we all know that maternal education is correlated with the, the error, okay? So there, there are not, there are, we have to control for that. The third one is that results point to the importance of family resources to ensure that education of the youth, especially that of the boys, uh, are given attention, due attention. The fourth results of uh, the paper have implications on labor market policies that cater principally to women. So just, that's a policy implication of the results that we've observed a while ago. And the fifth is that there's a substantial variation in the sense educational mobility estimates across regions and then in the uh, results, we saw that daughters are mobile in almost all regions. Okay, so finally, uh, because of the uh, regional uh, variability in terms of results, there's a need, especially for boys, there's a need to validate the results by a qualitative research method, such as key informal interviews and focus group discussions. So essentially, the mobility maps, so we hope that the mobility maps will provide information as to, as to where uh, relevant government agencies can direct their attention in order to promote educational mobility and social mobility. So thanks a lot uh, for your attention. One of the takeaways of Dr. Lawrence's presentation, as you can see in the slides, that we should still endeavor to um, um, to close the gap um, in terms of educational attainment, particularly uh, school performance of boys. And that will be the topic of our next presentation, which is titled Gender Education, Equity in Education, Helping the Boys Catch Up. And it will be uh, given to us by Dr. Vicente Pequeo who is um, a distinguished visiting fellow at uh, PIDS. Dr. Pequeo has, um, was a lead economist of the World Bank in Washington, D.C. and a professor of the UP School of Economics. And his areas of specialization are in education, social protection, and human development. Friends, Dr. Vicente Pequeo. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, I'm, temp I'm tempted to start my presentation by uh, telling you about uh, a story about my daughter. Um, and I, I, I will tell this to you uh, because um, um, as, a, as, a pro as proof that I'm actually pro-women. <laughs> because my, my topic is provocative and you might think it is anti-women. So my daughter, um, she's now what, 40, 36 years old. When uh, she was very young, like uh, four years old, um, told uh, her grandmother, you know, so ask her, what do you want to be when, you're, when you grow old, uh, when you're, you know, sort of uh, already an adult? I says, I want to be a truck driver. And poor grandmother nearly fell off her seat. Because of course, you know, stereotype says, you know, he, she's the traditional type. So she, she thought that, uh, you know, truck drivers are only for, uh, for men. So um, looking back at it, um, maybe we actually imparted to her, maybe not in words, but, but the way we uh, talk, that it's okay to be, to be any, anybody, anything you, that you want to be. So that's, that's uh, how I feel about, you know, each individual should be free to choose whatever uh, she wants to be. Anyway, so um, my uh, topic um, is, uh, Gender equity in education, and it is the title "Helping the Boys Catch Up." And I think um, uh, Lawrence has already, I think, uh, um, given some um, empirical evidence why this is uh, important uh, topic. Um, next, please. Uh, by the way, the this is a paper I'm going to be presenting. A, uh, a paper that uh, was written by Dr. Beta uh, and my myself. Uh, wala kasi meros yung uh, presentation ng impact evaluation namin sa DSWD on uh, for peace. So hati na lang kami ng sanday yung paano dito. Okay. Um, uh, there it is. So conceptually, I keep emphasizing uh, this. Conceptually, gender equality means that the status of human beings are equal in the eyes of the law and in practice, regardless of their gender. Um, historically, uh, the fight for gender equality uh, has been focused on raising the issue, uh, raising the status of women towards equality with men. Okay? So it has a particular point of view. Um, now, that is a, I claim that that is a sensible focus, given the uh, widespread discrimination, stereotyping, and abuse of men and women in various countries of the world. Um, now, situations, however, uh, can change, um, where males could eventually lag behind females in regard to education status and other aspects of well-being. And I say, from my experience, various experience, um, both here in the Philippines and when I was world being in various countries, 
in the world that gender advocacy uh, has benignly neglected boys in these situations where they're actually lagging behind because they were not really part of the agenda of the so-called women in development or gender equality. Now, the change situation could be that actually the world has made progress because of the fight of women for equality. Um, but much remains to be done. But there has been enough progress, however, in gender equality to, to the point where boys are now lagging behind in human capital development. <coughs> now, in this presentation, we argue that the fight for gender equality should now pay more attention to the education of boys without slowing down girls' educational uh, progress. So this is the, the main message of our presentation of this paper. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> so let me frame the issue uh, in, in terms of uh, graphs. So um, uh, this is uh, the trend from 1948 to 2015, where basically you see the, the, uh, the male uh, education uh, who have a finished college um, this is the blue line, uh, sorry, the red line, uh, blue, the blue line, okay. So this started out after the war to be higher, but notice, and, and the red line is the female, but notice that there is a crossover that occurred somewhere in the early 70s when I was doing my graduate studies. <laughs> But there is something, that, the reason I mentioned that because I have a story to tell about that. Okay, so now what you're saying is that there's this crossover and it is widening, actually. Okay, it's not converging. Now, the reason why I mentioned this because at the time when I was in the, in the early 70s, I was doing my PhD, I was an uh, instructor at, uh, at UP, and, um, and no, Willie there was my classmate. Kaya lang, puti lang ang buhok niya, ako wala na. Okay, so, at that time, so when I uh, became part of the UPSD faculty, I was part of the, um, what do you call this, uh, committee uh, that selects admission, admission. to the uh, 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 graduate program, to the PhD, MA and PhD uh, program. And Dr. Castro, uh, the economic historian who just passed away last year, and by the way, the original paper of this was uh, in his honor, is pu published in the uh, um, uh, Philippine Economic Review, uh, Philippine Review of Economics, as a Peace Griff volume, was calling our attention and says, oh, ilang bang lalaki dyan? Ilang bang babae? Eh, sasabihin niya, e, bakit kakaunti lang dito ang Ang lalaki, karamihan babae. Okay? So, so what's wrong with that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, we were just following guidelines based on, you know, uh, ability, criteria, the usual thing when you admit, you know, sort of. Um, and his complaint was, 
It should be balance. Oh, parang there should be more uh, men. Sabi namin, yung secretary of sinusunod, eh marami talagang magagaling na pumapasok nag-apply na babae. <laughs> eh sabi niya, hindi kasi you have to make adjustments na sa ano, hindi naman sa lalagay natin yan point by point na mayroon tayong parang kota. Kung hindi, you know, medyo you have to look at the broader picture. And in his view, para bang uh, the reason why maraming babae na magaganda yung records kaya yun ang pinipili natin is nung nasa high school pa sila sa elementary disiplinado sila uh, medyo uh, maaga pa lang sa bahay na pinag-aaral na mature na sila ang babae is spoiled and hindi pa disiplinado so medyo no pero yung to take into account na siguro pagka, pagka ano na sila, nasa market na sila, actually, the women stay at home and, ano, <laughs> and the men go and work. So, yun ang, ano, yung, ano, niya doon sa, ano. So, but what, what, the reason why to, to mention this is that, even at that time, wala pa itong datos nito, no? Because the reflect, parang reflected na sa, ano, uh, before they got reflected in this data, um, uh, Medyo na feel na yun sa ano sa UP na the women were actually beginning to dominate no uh, no so, so ang ano kan ang remembrance ko no na ano yung parang I think there will come a time na magko cross over na yung ano magko cross over na and si si you know si Dr. Beta who was following me several a uh, couple of few years later did actually, uh, and this came from his paper with um, uh, Ms. Sanchez, uh, uh, work on this issue uh, uh, because that was very intriguing. Na sa UP, uh, nagkakaroon ka talaga ng ano, maraming mga babae and barang magka-cross over, mag-dominate mag, mag, mag na mga babae sa, sa enrollment. Anyway, yeah, so... At the time also, nandun na yung women in development, no? Nag, sa international concern, etc. Meron pa nga doon, uh, no? meron pa nga para bang, uh, in a sense, there was a cognitive dissonance. Bakit tayo nag, ano, ng, ng women in development na eh, dito nga lang sa UP, ano na, uh, it's really a famous women. <laughs> Parang, parang there was uh, this, this, this joint perception, this joint perception. Anyway, so I think sa conclusion, ng ano, may kita mo naman dito yung, ano, yung gap between boys and girls, particularly among the poor, it is really large in terms of completing uh, uh, secondary education. Ito naman, so, an out of school youth, this came from uh, Dr. Albert from Kutz and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and Clarissa. Yes, I'm sure you that the, out of, the rate of out of school children is much higher for boys than for girls. Out of school. So, lalo na sa mga itong ages na medyo maano na, wala kina kumalaki ang diferensya. And this one basically shows the again that boys are lagging behind in test scores. Test scores. Yeah, this is man. Sa mga test scores, no? Sa mathematics, sa science, etc. Consistently, the girls, uh, 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 the boys are lagging, lagging behind. So, the Philippines, including men and myself, as I mentioned at the beginning, takes pride in the educational accomplishments of our women. Alam na yun, na-mention kanina, number one tayo sa ranking. Uh, in terms of the gender uh, equality. But in education. Now, on the flip side, I'm not going to say on the dark side, the Philippine government 
and its Philippine and its development partners are doing little, however, to address the fact that boys are increasingly being left behind by girls in academic <coughs> achievement. Now, this Philippine experience raises three questions about gender advocacy. First, why are boys being left behind by girls in most indicators of educational development? Second, how concerned should the Philippines be about boys lagging behind girls in education? And third, should the local and international community promoting gender equality pay greater attention to boys being left behind in education? Okay. So uh, these are the, the questions that I'm going to comment on. <clears throat> There's several hypotheses on why boys are lagging behind girls in education when you look at the uh, literature. Um, so, boys mature later and are less disciplined than girls due to cultural and parenting practices. So, this is what I mentioned to you about uh, Dr. Cast Castro's view, you know. Um, and also that actually, I mentioned there, uh, Father Lynch, who is a, a pioneering Filipino sociologist, who, who basically wrote a paper about the Philippines being uh, actually a matriarchal, matriarchal society that spoils boys, okay? Uh, now, so that's, that's one set of hypotheses. The other is so-called poverty pressures. Males drop out of school earlier for uh, to go to work, to, augment household income kasi hindi sufficient so nagtatrabaho uh, members of the family but particularly the, the boys particularly if they are in the rural areas farms etc so makikita mo kanina out of school na kaya din sila during those uh, uh, beginning years work, work uh, years no? so uh, and, and these are this been kind of looked at by uh, Orbeta and Sanchez in their 1995 paper that I mentioned earlier. So boys of poor families appear to be uh, as, like, um, as a result, it appears that boys of families, uh, poor families appear to be uninterested in and unresponsive to learning, at least relative to, to girls. I'll uh, show you the table uh, that um, Dr. Albert uh, and his co-authors have uh, put together. They also have more work opportunities than, than girls, according to uh, uh, Boy's 1992 paper. Now, the third uh, thing is that, can I have another thing? The rate of return to education is higher for men than women, okay? And that was estimated by Tan and uh, his co her co-authors. Um, so that, in effect, the incentive to invest more intensively in girls is higher because the reward is higher. So then there's the fourth set of hypotheses, which is that which relates to the school environment. The thesis is that school environment is not gender neutral. Uh, because of uh, uh, various teaching practices or gender bias of, uh, of teachers, stereotyping, etc. Uh, for example, in the UNGI report, uh, it was noticed in their, <coughs> their, their, their FGDs that boys sit behind, uh, you know, far away from the blackboard. Uh, ito yung Thailand, I think Cambodia, Malaysia, five uh, countries, where, where basically young, young girls, schools was associated with being for smart girls. Kaya yung mga girls, yung mga smart girls, nasa front sila. Yung mga boys, yung mga bulakbol kagaya ko, nandun na kami sa likod. Okay? Okay, so 
Then the, we have another thing here that just to uh, about that uh, teacher bias. There was a study in 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 France that basically uh, pointed using uh, experimental methods that the grading ng you know, teacher is biased in favor of girls. So if it's a woman teacher, uh, blind one ito, uh, in effect uh, experiment. Na, na you know, it uh, uh, medyo higher yung grade na you know, na binibigay niya sa mga sa mga girls, okay? Mas bababa sa boys. And it had long term effect later on in terms of how the students perceive themselves and so the girls were encouraged to, to take mathematics, hard sciences, etc. The boys went to softer things, you know. And, and so it, it, it has this long-term uh, effect. Now, uh, Max again, there are two other papers that he read that uh, shows that it had no impact, this bias. And what I'm telling Mike is that there could be a heterogeneity effect depending on the cultural context. So, and then itong sa kay Mochi naman, the effect of female teachers in boys is significant depending on the the, commu the community context. So presumably, yung pag medyo yung yung community, kasi low income community, the impact is most is significant. While in in a more a richer community, it's presumably is modern less constrained by the women men interaction in a muslim community maybe not that constraining anymore anyway so i was mentioning earlier about boys are less interested in attending a school than, than girls um we have to test out some of those hypotheses that i mentioned could explain why that, that could be but you know a systematic study of why this lack of interest needs to be done so here, for example, you can you can see the big difference between boys and girls in terms of um, the reasons being given why they uh, uh, stop attending school. Okay, this one shows you that the uh, essentially among the poor, the uh, the uh, women are more favored than male or vice versa. Uh, the, 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 the boys are basically uh, uh, is more affected by the by the poverty, okay, than uh, the girls. So, let me uh, give my conclusions and reflections. So, historically, Filipino males were somewhat more educated than females. Now, the males are lagging behind the females and the education gender gap is widening. Today, therefore, one can argue that gender equality advocacy should go beyond the stere stereotypical focus on girls' education and pay more attention to issues that are hurting boys. Uh, on this point, greater clarity is needed about the meaning and application of the gender equality objective in education for situations where boys are lagging behind girls. There, have been, there has been some concern about the need for a more nuanced view of gender equity and the possible emergence of reverse gender inequality before this was reflected in national statistics. This concern is now recognized, but little is being done about it. The international development uh, jet setters continue to treat the Philippine experience as an outlier or unique. Arguably, helping a disadvantaged boys catch up with girls in education is a fair application of the gender e equality principle. This catch up should be anchored on win-win strategies. What do you mean? Win-win strategies that raises the current low, low, we have a low level, of educational performance of both boys and girls, while helping the latter, that's the boys, 
catch up with girls. So it's not, it should not be treated as kind of uh, faster development for boys at the expense of girls. No. You have to find strategies in which both girls and boys will improve their performance, but allowing and encouraging uh, things that actually allow the boys to catch up. Failure to pursue strategies that addresses gender bias or biases hurtful to boys or girls for that matter means reduced economic returns to human <coughs> capital investment. For the adaptation of gender equality advocacy to be effective, however, more information and some experimentation are needed. One, to identify gender biases that hurt boys or girls and ways for effectively minimizing them. Therefore, more studies on household, teachers, and school attitudes, norms, and practices should be pursued and experimentation undertaken to address possible gender biases. For example, systematic study should be done on the effects of female teacher dominance. You know, that are public schools, and I think maybe private, they're dominated by uh, female uh, teachers. Um, not that I'm saying that there's already a proven adverse effect, but I think it would be interesting to look at how uh, that, um, that, that, that ambience actually affect boys' education. Um, and so, uh, Second, the pilot study to test the cost effectiveness of giving a bigger conditional grant amount for the boys of CCT families might be a good tool. In Mexico, their conditional cash transfers is actually gender kind of uh, sensitive in the sense that they actually give more uh, for, uh, for girls to attend school, secondary school. And that's because the prob their problem was the girls were lagging behind. Okay, so now our problem is just the opposite. So maybe we can try uh, boys to be given some incentive or the, the parents to invest more in girls. I mean, in, in boys, sorry. So, and, and by the way, well, like, 15 years or 20 years later, there was an impact evaluation on the effect of that incentive on the labor market performance of the recipients no? of, the, of, this, of this grant. And it turns out that the rate of return was pretty high of about 23% uh, or so. Rate of return, economic rate of return, not financial, economic rate of return. So, the fourth is a systematic review of gender equality advocacy and how current practices can be adapted to the education landscape should be undertaken. I think we need to disrupt a little bit the comfortable way by which this gender equality advocacy is being pursued. The Philippine experience is not unique. You know about the World Bank, recent World Bank report, estimating around, around the world, various countries, the human capital stock, education and health. You know about that? So they estimated this human capital stock based on, on health and, and education, etc. For, I don't know, maybe about 100, 100 plus, 140 countries. And I was just curious. So I had it tabulated, looking at the ratio of the female to male human capital. So it is greater than one if the male are, have a higher human capital in that country, okay, and, and lower for males. So it's greater than one, meaning it favors girls, for example. 
you know what? What do you think? What do you think? What is the percentage of the countries <coughs> that favor male, uh, females? I was shocked. Because the impression that we got, we were getting, is that the, in education, at least, the, the, the males are jihado. The females are, uh, the, the females are jihado. And it turns out that about 70% of countries actually have ratios which favor the females. And all the time, we are being told, or I was told in various conferences, that the Philippine experience is unique. It's an outlier. But it turns out it's more common. That's it. Thank you. much to our two presenters for their uh, enlightening presentations. I'd like to invite both of them here for the open forum. Dr. Dakoy Koy and uh, Dr. Pakeo, please. Okay. So I now open the floor for questions. As before, uh, let's take three questions at a time and please wait to be recognized and please give your name and uh, affiliation uh, before uh, stating your question or comment and please make your comments and questions as brief as possible. May I have the first question, please? Okay, sir, to be followed by uh, si ma'am and then the other lady. Good morning again, the Tan Agustin, uh, Sakan and the East Avenue Medical Center. Um, since we are in a policy institution, uh, and by the way, thank you for your excellent presentations, sirs. To both of you, please uh, uh, kindly expound on what would be uh, your recommendation for a policy to be adopted by the Philippine uh, national government by uh, PINS. So, number one. Number two is an observation only. Uh, I attended also a forum in UP where by the former dean of uh, NC Bank uh, raised a concern regarding dropouts in the K-12. More female in the K-12 dropouts. That's the statistics I hope the, the PSA here would, uh, some would validate that. And uh, number, uh, since I'm also with the medical field, one observation also is policy. For example, in the UP College of Medicine, uh, Admission for a female to be admitted in the UP School of Medicine. Their grades, the female grades must be higher than the male. Is this a sound policy? So your first question regarding uh, what recommendation they can give about, you know, in terms of policy recommendations. So does, does it refer to uh, increasing or, or uh, improving the school performance of boys? Is that what you mean? Okay. So, first question is on recommended policy. Second is uh, uh, your, your comment on that again. He said that there are more female dropouts in the K 12. And third is uh, your comment on. Uh, Female candidates or female entrants to the School of Medicine should have uh, should have better grades or should, should have higher grades to be admitted to the to the School of Medicine. So first, I, I get the, the most uh, simple question to answer is the third one. I think it's discriminatory for you to impose such a requirement. So equality should be respected as far as the screening procedures are concerned. So f that's my that's my opinion there. So it's e the easiest to address. Now, uh, well, essentially in our in our study, um, we're talking about regional patterns that haven't been uncovered before. And uh, when you, for instance, when you read 
uh, international reports, they always talk about, <coughs> they treat the Philippines as a whole. So which means that you don't capture exactly how regional outcomes vary. Uh, so one policy recommendation that I can, can think of uh, right now is that, well, you have to understand how come the daughters are more mobile relative to their parents when compared to, to sons. So there must be cultural factors. Yeah. Uh, in play, there must be, if you talk about regional outcomes, so maybe you have to pay close attention to how the budget is allocated in each of the regions. So what's the educational policy? What are the learning outcomes? And if I may, the educational landscape now is quite, is, uh, quite different from, okay, so we focus on different cohorts. So the educational system before is quite outdated if you're trying to appreciate trends in education now. So you have learning outcomes, for instance, that are that must be properly designed. In in college, for instance, we now adopt the outcome based education. And but then it's true, no? You you when you talk about basic education, I guess the most important for me but uh, this is just my view. There are a lot of dynamics that happen within the household. So for instance, if the parent, one of the parents, if the boy who underachieved early in his uh, life becomes a father. So just think about the quality of transmission, uh, quality that his attributes, the quality of his attributes that will be transmitted to the boy, to his sons. So that's the reason why I agree with Dr. Pakeo that we have to pay close attention to the gap, the burgeoning gap right now because uh, if you think about it, the boys will become fathers, and then there is assortative mating in the sense that maybe they will marry uh, uh, women who are also not who have not achieved highly in terms of education. So the folk, uh, I know that it's a it's a place that we have to minimize uh, interventions, but in the household there are a lot of dynamics that support the persistence of. Uh, low persistence of low social mobility. So it's true. No? If you're talk, talk, talking about the Philippines, there's this general idea where uh, about the degree to which uh, our our population or subpopulations are mobile. But then you also have to understand, for you to understand the macro picture, go to the level of the household, and then in there you will notice or observe the way abilities uh, get transmitted from one generation to another. So it's, uh, sir, it's not exactly a concrete policy recommendation, but then uh, there are ways through which you can improve household-based outcomes for you to support a, a highly mobile, mobile society. Those are not observed there because they, they, rec they do require uh, so, uh, so is a more sophisticated thing. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, surprised about, uh, and I haven't seen that, that report from you, about the, the uh, dropout uh, rate of well, uh, girls. We haven't seen that uh, because our the, the, what I presented to you, the completion rate, etc. Well, at least for up to grade ten, yeah, that point, you know, it's it's it, it favors the, the, the girls. The complete the completion rate is is, is higher. And I would and, and, and even I think when you look at the college level enrollment rate. Uh, you know, it's 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 the same story. So I I I I, I would say I I plead ignorance about uh, and uh, right right. Um, the um, the the thing about uh, your question about um, uh, having um, <coughs> screening, right? the, uh, the filtering. Uh, First, that's going to be uh, practiced probably more prevalently now that everybody is supposed to get free 
tuition fee in issues fees. Why? Because of the limited space and you have this huge number of applicants, so you have to ration things, right? So when you do that, what happens is that you need to impose some kind of rational way of um, uh, selecting, okay? Now, and if you don't, if, if you don't uh, apply explicit criteria, what will happen is padrino system, huh? Okay. So what they usually do, and this is done throughout the world, is okay, kung sino yung matas na test scores, for example. Uh, tapos kung meron silang program na uh, tawag doon yung uh, parang uh, proactive, ano, yung affirmative action, so you will be given a slot. So they will do some quantitative <coughs> Quantitative uh, rationing, as you say, no? who gets admitted, who is not. And usually, what happens is the poor lose out. More, uh, the, the, the less poor, the middle class, you know, uh, are actually of, oftentimes because they have better preparation, they went to Ateneo, they went to La Salle, you know, they are the ones who will be. Uh, Pro disproportionately taken into uh, to, uh, admitted, so that that and that happens. That's the pattern. Uh, and and in terms of gender, uh, I I think uh, uh, I don't know how explicit that is, but to the extent that as we have shown here, the girls and this is what the Madu Castro was saying. If you just base it on the SAT scores or uh, upcut the uh, scores for, for UP, the girls do better. So they will have a better chance. Okay? So that will be the, the implications uh, that I want to connect about this policy of universal free education. Now, an alternative policy, if you're asking me about some policy suggestion, is just actually um, adapt a voucher system. Like, what is actually in the law but has not been applied. Just fund that unifast law. Where basically you have categories of this scholarship for, for those that you want to encourage because they are so gifted and talented. The other ones are grants in aid, uh, which, you know, if you are poor or, or uh, coming from marginal uh, kind of thing, you are not the brightest. But you want to encourage actually more inclusion. Uh, then, what in in that law there's specification as to what are the criteria. It has to be explicit, and then they are free to choose under that law whether you go to public or private school or this school or or that school, and you can the board. A university board can look at the rules of the game to make sure it is equitable, and and it is uh, the the criteria for selection <coughs> are explicit and reasonable, <coughs> and based on merit as well as need. Uh, so that's the policy that I would actually strongly uh, recommend: a free choice but guided at the same time. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Marian Degapatan from the Philippine Business Coalition for Women Empowerment. Um, I actually have a lot of questions, but I'll summarize it in two, three. Um, the first would be, uh, as experts now on gender issues or issues covering uh, on women, um, how did your findings affect the dynamics within your own households? The next question would be, what changes did you implement at home or maybe in your own workplace? And the last one will be, what are your recommendations to everyone or to people here um, who support the, the women empowerment advocacy? I'm asking in the point of view of millennials who need role models. Siyempre. 
And it's good really that we know, but how can we in our own way, how can we act on it? Thank you. Thank you. Those are uh, personal but uh, very uh, relevant questions. So, I'm a very private person. <laughs> so, sabi niya, how did your findings affect the dynamics in your own household now? And then, uh, second is uh, changes in the workplace that you would want to see, no? Given this uh, results. And third one was uh, advocacy. Yeah. yeah. How would you for the millennials? For, for the millennials, who would want to spread or to spread the message? What's your recommendation for us? Oh, <laughs> recommendations for the millennials. Uh, who would, who can be our partners in spreading uh, the message on gender equality? So the first one, gentlemen. Contribution for their wives. I'm happy to admit that I'm under desire. <laughs> now, um, I am a libertarian, essentially, and my, my children, uh, maybe I regret these days, but maybe not, uh, uh, they're all in the U.S. and um, I deliberately or consciously, when they were growing up, did not try to influence what courses they take. I was telling you about they can be truck drivers, they can be nurses, they can be... One thing that I did not talk to them about was economics. Because I did not necessarily want them to, to, to track them to follow my footsteps. As much as possible, they should be free to choose that which they are passionate about and something that they think they are capable of and really want to make a difference in. So, predictably, nobody became an economist. Home economics. Home economics. Uh, and as, as I said, and I said it really sincerely, although I was joking uh, when I said it, but sincerely, uh, I'm really proud of the Philippines, uh, of, of the achievements of, of, of women in, in, in the Philippines. But also generally, uh, I work, uh, when I work at the World Bank uh, and, and some others, my bosses were women. I was there for about uh, 23 years. And they're smart. They're good managers. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a problem for, 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 for me. In fact, I, 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 I mean, I, I but to, that, to the extent that I would say gender does not matter in, 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 in so many ways. It's really your person, how you think, uh, how as a human being you are, um, the, the, um, maybe I, I care about uh, how you think about certain things. But even that, I'm also very open-minded. So, my, my philosophy to the millennials is, one, and I actually got this uh, from <coughs> my mentor, Dr. Jose Encarnacion, who's a philosopher. And a lot of us uh, who graduated and, and taught at the University of the Philippines, is A, think logically and critically, <coughs> look at the evidence, and be honest, both intellectually and otherwise. Okay, so 
<laughs> I'll ask your permission first. So, but, <laughs> but, but let me start by... Uh,
dalawa yung boys, tatlo yung anak ko, yung uh, babae yung panganay, dalawa yung lalaki. They have somebody to communicate with and to follow uh, what's good behavior, how to relate. <coughs> so, but I just, that was just good luck. So, but that's why, one way of saying that, you know, um, uh, in, in one of the things that we are, we are lucky with is that, uh, as I said, uh, that we can be proud of is that our women are really, uh, in many ways, sets a, a good example. The um, other thing that I want to just uh, uh, call your attention to is the importance of so-called non-cognitive competencies or so-called <laughs> socio-emotional skills and that includes so-called grit, you know, the ability to really pursue something that, that you want uh, and, and uh, uh, what I call this, the, the uh, diligence, all those virtues, they're very important and according to uh, Nobel laureate uh, James Heckman and his colleagues of neuroscientists and psychologists, they actually account for about two-thirds of the success of your future, uh, your children, when they become adults. So while we emphasize cognitive competencies, uh, we cannot underestimate, which often schools do underestimate, the importance, the critical importance uh, of so-called non-cognitive skills, sometimes they're called character traits, okay, uh, in the success of your children. And your success. Thank you, Dr. Kobe and um, Dr. Boy. Other questions, please? I think I recognize you before, ma'am, please. Um, I don't know how to react, but um, I, I had this feeling while the, the two gentlemen were reporting that um, it was uh, obviously presented and researched by men. Because <laughs> um, for one, the hypothesis that um, the return on investment on education, that was also the reason why uh, the female the women in development also wanted to have the right for education because um, the culture then was there was no return in investment if it's the female who studies. Kasi mag-aasawa lang naman yan. So bakit ka mag invest ng education? And yet, this is also the reason being used while the boys are lagging behind. Second, the school environment is not gender, gender neutral because it's dominated by female teachers. But that has been the case ever since. Even when the boys were not lagging behind. So the situation was the same. So, I mean, the environment was the same. Is it because now that the women or the female uh, or the the, I, the feeling I had was while I was listening to you is that the reason why the boys are lagging behind is due to the progress that women are having now um, in asserting their rights, uh, at least not equal, but asserting the same opportunities that were being given to the boys. Uh, are we now saying that the reason that the boys are lagging behind is because of the women who are now asserting and um, <laughs> um, being developed. Parang ano yata, uh, ironic that the same reasons are now being used uh, by the research. Thank you.
Yeah, those are my hypotheses and what they I presented them so that they can be examined and empirically verified. Those are starting points, you know, for for doing doing the studies. I'm not saying that because the women, uh, 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 because of the progress that women has has made, that that caused the boy to lag behind. No, I did not say that. I was very careful not to say that. Um, as you can see from the the trends that I presented, um, both are rising, right? Both are rising. But the girls are moving faster than the boys, okay? Now, what we're saying is that it is a fact that they're lagging behind. Now, what do we do about it? Should we just benignly neglect it? Or we do something about it? If you think that it doesn't matter whether the boys are, will lag more and more behind, then you know, uh, th there may be arguments for not caring about it. But if what you're saying philosophically is that we stick with the principle of gender equality, for God's sake, be consistent. So that you don't lose credibility. Hi, Mia Bunao po ng Kalitista. So, um, involved kami sa non-motorized transportation and pedestrian um, advocacy work. So, as work uh, advocates in the transportation sector, I cannot help but make comparisons. So, one, gusto ko lang po mag-share um, ng reaction based on a data that I saw na isa sa mga factors, actually maliit yung factor eh, na yung distance from school. Uh, may, meron kasi graph kanina, yung factors about uh, yung engagement nila, uh -oh, affecting um, their engagement in, in getting to school, ganyan, etc. So, maliit lang yung factor ng um, getting to school. Pero, I'd like to share lang po, in, in one of our networks, um, na maganda siguro later on, um, tignan ninyo for further research, kasi I don't think there's been research on it. May 20 areas uh, which benefit from um, increasing the attendance of children, school children, uh, I think high, sc high school, um, increase in attendance due to the fact that they were given bicycles. So in the mobility, the actual mobility factor. So, kasi mag, um, dahil it takes them about an hour to get to school. So, nagda-drop, either they drop out, hindi yung ma-attend, or they're not attentive. So, yung performance nila is not very good. Um, pero pag titignan mo yung, um, yung, beneficiaries of that program across the 20 schools. Like, it varies siya na mas maraming babae, minsan mas maraming lalaki. Pero pagka in-average out siya, mas maraming lalaki. Um, hindi necessarily because of the use of the bicycle, ang sabi nila. So, it's an area na pwede pang tignan. Kasi it's an area na usually hindi rin tinitignan uh, pag-aralan na may factor talaga yung access to school walking or uh, you, you miss mong transportation, even how um, roads are being built. Nakita ko kasi when um, yun sa fina-flash screen, yung mga partners, may NCTS, transportation, ganyan. Um, us coming from that sector, we would like to see sana more researches that are reflective of. Um, dahil sa transportation, yun sa vulnerable ro road users, madalas hindi na to take into consideration. Although meron mga um, milestones na, kagaya sa maritime, ang una mong i-evacuate are the women, children, and the elderly. So, doon palang kita mo na. Pero on the other, pagka rin rescue mo lang, di ba? Pero doon sa actual na day-to-day -day activities natin, wala much kung iisipan mo um, for the general commuting public. Tapos pangalawa po, um, I was trying to get more information tungkol sa um, the role of yung actual enforcement of legislation. Yung inter, parang yung, yung uh, kasi madalas marami tayong batas, pero hindi siya na-enforce. So, meron bang um, impact yun do sa result ng studies? Enforcement of laws. 
Um, yung, yung mga, I'm assuming kasi po, naka-inventory na everything related to gender. The gender agenda. Tapos pagka kinos reference nyo po dun sa mga pag-aaral nyo, um, may enforcement po dun sa educational side of things. But for the other factors, y- yun po. Kasi sa transport po, ang usual problem is the enforcement. And I think it also encompasses in other areas. Even for academia. Uh, for this purpose. <laughs> Uh, okay, so ma'am, yung second one, I, I, I will just uh, share with you some insights. Um, in the UK, for instance, they have a department on social mobility. So I think we, we don't need a department here, but then there must be an agency that will oversee how laws that have intergenerational applications can be uh, monitored. For instance, if you talk about edu- educational outcomes, so what are the laws that are that govern, let's say the the way education is is educational reforms are implemented, and then try to understand, try to extract some intergenerational implications of those. So, but because it's always a case that the existing laws are enhanced, so which means that there must be a way to fully account for such implications. So, if we have something like that, then a long run. A concept or phenomenon like social mobility can be addressed early. The the issues associated it, with it can be addressed early. Yes. Um, I'm not. Uh, I don't have anything to say about that. But I have. Uh, I have something to say about access. Um, and th- this transportation thing. Um, that really depends on the level of education. Uh, if you look at uh, elementary education, almost all barangays have a school. So that's not a problem. When you look at secondary education, and I would imagine, particularly if you're talking about the junior high and senior high, high school. Uh, 10, no, uh, 11, and 12, school. you may have a problem. In fact, uh, for, 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 for a lot of children. Because I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, 40% or more of barangays do not have high school. So that means that they have to travel. So access is an, is an, is an issue, indeed. And, and I think, Mike, in our uh, empirical analysis that the, where we use that as an instrument variable, it did significantly impact enrollment rate, right? So it does have a significant impact on schooling. Now. I've seen in some municipalities in Suriga where I come from, where uh, some of the municipalities have schools, uh, sorry, uh, school buses, where they travel. I don't know how widespread this uh, system of school buses to pick up and bring children to school and home. I'm familiar with the school bus system for Surigao. Um, it was, in fact, because of um, the Japanese mining company um, present in that area. So, yung kaya kaya po kaya ng data um, pag nailalagak siya sa proper agencies that have the capacity to actually implement, sila na kaka implement. So, minsan in in that case, it's the private industry of the mining mining, um, but it's not parang present in all um, localities. Like you said, Sabiko, worthy of looking into is that they have baseline data already for that 20 pilot areas of schools that have, um, because of the bicycle, they have access to uh, sa school. So from Bicol to Baclayon in uh, Bohol, tapos Pampanga, etc. Kumbaga, basically, Luzon, 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 Luzon. So if anybody really, because yung NGO na yun, 
um, they're into the implementation of the project. But I, I think and I feel not only them, but the rest of the country could actually benefit in a deeper study of that. That there is a pilot and baseline. Po. Suggestions or what one of the recommendations of the study team to DSWD uh, in, uh, for the Pantawid Pamilyang Pilipino uh, PID study team um, led by uh, our president, our current president, Dr. Celia Reyes, recommended that the allowance for the beneficiaries of uh, CC children, uh, the allowance of CCP children, particularly for the boys, will be However, this was not adopted uh, by, by the government. So we are still waiting for uh, you know, change in that particular aspect. So, uh, other comments? Good afternoon. I'm Leah Barbia from the Commission on Human Rights. Um, Given the boys lagging behind for, uh, in terms of education and social mobility, I just want to know uh, what detrimental issues do you foresee given the fact that boys are lagging behind? Can we see, foresee that uh, there, this could be um, correlated to higher um, criminality, crime rate in the future? And um, given the fact that uh, we, we could say that more women will be dominating the the higher level of society. So, uh, what do we foresee in terms of experiencing women dominance? Uh, that, that's my question. And then, uh, for the beads, where do we bring these studies? Like we hear a lot of good uh, studies um, since this morning. I think this is a great venue to advocate for uh, policy and. Uh, legislative uh, legislations, um, particularly for women, but I, I think uh, uh, there are more avenues where we can advocate the studies. So how 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 do we bring these um, uh, studies to um, uh, audience that could really capture uh, or uh, say decision makers that could really uh, how do you call it um, give more. Uh, spaces for these studies. Thank you. Okay, for the first uh, question, what um, possible negative impacts do we foresee? Well, we can only assume for now, no? Uh, of boys lagging behind. Uh, and second is, uh, do we, if this persists, do we see a situation where in women will be dominating? Uh, not just the household probably, but uh, society in general. And the third one is uh, how do we bring this to the general public, uh, particularly in the minds of our uh, policy makers uh, who are, you know, uh, the ones that has the, uh, um, the responsibility of making sure that there is really uh, gender equality in the truest sense of the word. First question, ano bang masasabi natin doon? Ma, ano yung sinarim na kikita? Wala naman. Uh, well, okay. Uh, I, will, I will just talk about how important social mobility is. Um, social mobility kasi, it, it pertains to the um, to dynamic outcomes pertaining to uh, a particular subpopulation. So if you consider the subpopulation of boys who are who have been established as um, educationally immobile, for instance, then if that gets to if that gets sustained over time, then you may have a problem as to how these boys um, um, appreciate opportunities in the future. So your your economy is growing. But then, so therefore, the jobs, uh, some of the jobs created with technical skills that are associated with uh, tertiary education. And then if the boys don't achieve uh, academically, highly, highly don't achieve uh, highly desirable academic outcomes, then they're not in a position to benefit 
from economic growth. So that's uh, the first one. The second one is I agree with Dr. Pakeo's uh, explanation a while ago that pay close, pay, in, pay attention to non-cognitive outcomes. So there are skills right now are multidimensional, right? You don't say that you're highly skilled because you graduated from college. You're highly skilled because your skill set is multidimensional. Now, if you're if you have a if you have a good set of non-cognitive skills, then you are in a position to enjoy success in the future, not only in the labor market. So, based on Heckman's study, for instance, a boy. Okay, let's just focus on boys. A boy who is exposed or who was exposed to a lot of activities in preschool, let's say leadership, uh, you know, he was able to manifest leadership qualities and other abilities, is in a position to enjoy better labor outcomes, that's the first one, more employed siya, he is less likely to commit crimes. So focus, if you're a policymaker, you first recognize the importance of multidimensional skills. Don't focus exclusively or don't reward exclusively cognitive skills like test scores. But then try to develop the way, the ability of the child to engage with other people more socially, to exhibit uh, uh, not only cognitive abilities but then leadership skills, the ability to negotiate, the ability to reason, the ability to, to become a team player, I think the schools, uh, well, I, some schools are doing a lot uh, in shaping non-cognitive outcomes, but then in the public schools, they have to focus on that. If you want your children to be more socially conscious, they have to be able to empathize with other people at, at their age. So something like that needs to be reinforced. It's not going to be good if you only reinforce something like that when they're in, in, the, in college. So it's not, it's not a good idea. So it has the, you have to start them now. Yeah. Uh, just to, to add, uh, add to, to that. Um, so we are now recognizing the importance of character, personality traits, uh, social emotional skills, these, these things. But one thing that is becoming clear after talking with, um, uh, before he uh, stepped down from Deep Ed, the uh, brother Andrew, and then sort of uh, others. When I asked the question about the importance of these non-cognitive uh, skills to develop, um, basically his answer was, we're doing so many things already and it is not within our mandate to develop this in, in fact, public schools, and schools. On the other hand, this WD uh, also says, you know, we can only do so much and, uh, and uh, but we're only focused on X, Y, and Z in terms of providing assistance. And so the, the, the message being that there's really nobody responsible for the development of these non-cognitive skills, these character traits of, 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 of children. And uh, as Shella was saying, we should start them young and at home. So we're thinking maybe it is this WD, but this WD is doing so much. So this very important thing, development agenda, is falling through the cracks and nobody can be held responsible. So if you're talking about maybe making laws or strengthening certain things so that this agenda can be pursued systematically, this is one of the things that I would recommend. Now, 
on the question of uh, uh, what was that the uh, what are there adverse effects uh, of uh, boys uh, lagging behind? My first concern um, is that we just want to make sure that the reason why they're lagging behind is not due to some barriers or some impediments uh, that has nothing to do with the ability and the desire of the boys to get ahead. That it is not because it is being conditioned by certain stereotypes or a school environment that does not allow him, because he's a boy, or if a girl, because he's a girl, to blossom to his fullest you know, uh, capability. And the reason why that is my first concern uh, is that as much as possible, human beings should be able to achieve to, to their fullest uh, uh, capability. Um, and, and that these various things exist, but we don't have systematic information yet about whether these school practices actually stifles uh, the development of girls or boys. We have stories about this and that, but uh, so even, for example, so-called classroom practices, the dominance of, of you know, we, we really don't have uh, evidence that is kind of uh, validated in the Philippine context, there are foreign uh, studies, but we have to be concerned about the validity of those studies in the context of Philippine culture and practices. So, so that's, that's my concern, that, that it will be a waste of talent, it will be a waste of human resources if boys or girls are unable to achieve their fullest. So that's one. And this is why, in, in a sense, those discrimination, those, those uh, <coughs> bar artificial barriers um, that uh, cultural or otherwise cultural, even if they were useful in the past but may not be useful now anymore, has to be removed. But we need to have a better understanding of what those unproductive barriers, filters, stereotypings, etc. Uh, in terms of the of our last question on the last question of the lady in how we uh, uh, bring the studies, the results of the studies to the consciousness of, uh, uh, of particular of our policymakers and of course the general public. Well, we have been, you know, this is our way of um, uh, holding the seminars one of our ways to uh, um, disseminate the results of uh, the studies of PIDS. In fact, uh, we only started, um, started the seminar series last year. Uh, it was initiated by Dr. Takui Koy, and we intend to do this on a yearly basis. And at the same time, uh, the PIDS also has uh, started to, make, to, to conduct more studies uh, related to gender with uh, the help of uh, Dr. Connie Dakoyko. He is who is our, you know, gender and development champion <laughs> here at PIDS. And then we have also, also have ongoing collaboration, partnership with the House of Representatives and uh, the Senate. So the studies that we, uh, that you heard today will not just be presented here, but we also intend to uh, bring this to our, um, um, to the Senate and, and the Congress through our partners there. So, mas marami makakadinig, mas marami ang uh, ma-enlighten, no? And in particular, our policy makers who are at the forefront, forefront of development planning and policy makers. Okay, uh, other questions, please? I saw some hands at the back. Okay, Ivory, please. Okay, ikaw na. Uh, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Ivory. I'm a research associate at PIDS. Uh, I would like to comment on the recommendation of Dr. Pakeo about the higher grant um, amount for boys among the CCP families. But first, I would like to check if my understanding is correct about the um, um, enrollment mechanics um, in the CCT. Uh, as I understand it, the families have the prerogative to choose who among their children will be enrolled as long as they qualify the, the conditions um, with regard to age, age limit. Um, if, I think your recommendation would, would be um, a bit discriminatory against, um, toward uh, girls, because families, the parents would tend to choose the, the boys over the girls. If my assumption, if my understanding is correct, that the families have the prerogative to choose. Because um, as I know, they have a maximum of three children. They can enroll a maximum of three children. So that's my question for uh, Are you saying that it's going to be discriminatory if uh, because if the boys are given additional um, grant, a higher grant that they will choose boys. Okay, that, that's that's uh, that's a good um, good uh, a question. Very good question. And uh, that that but that's precisely the the purpose. Because in a sense now, the the girls are ahead of the boys, the boys are lagging behind. So in a sense, you want to influence without forcing, but you know, gently nudging uh, the choice of parents to invest a little bit more on the boys. Pay more attention to them, a little bit more. So that's, that's the idea. The study of Dr. Reyes and her team has shown that at a certain age, the, school, the, the boys are not able to complete schooling. No? The older boys, no? because their parents pull them out from school so that they can help in the farm. So that's why there is the need for the incentive, the higher allowance. Ah, okay. My kabati. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your presentations. Uh, I have a comment uh, with regard to Dr. Pakeo's uh, hypothesis uh, in relation to the <laughs> earlier comments. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, actually, it's uh, not really a comment. It's more of a um, sort of suggestion uh, that. Uh, in relation to the poverty pressure which you mentioned, uh, I think the disadvantage of boys, that is to say the, the, the reason for boys lagging behind in terms of enrollment, uh, may be related to the topic this morning about wage disparity. At least uh, a sort of a hypothesis that I would like to put forward in the sense that, you know, if wages, as, and as, as I've mentioned, uh, actually in, in my s uh, own study, uh, at lower years of schooling, you have uh, uh, wages for males higher than for females. And that means that actually the opportunity cost for, for boys no, in attending school is actually higher that means that, of course, you know, uh, there is less opportunity for females to go to school, so you just send them to school. While for, me for boys, the opportunity cost is higher, so they, in fact, uh, instead uh, work instead of uh, going to, to school. Uh, and that's, it's, that's one hypothesis I would like to put forward. And uh, another... Uh, although I think uh, with regard to wage disparity, 
And in, in relation to the topic uh, earlier this morning, I would like to just add that we have a lot of, we have data, a lot of data on behavior like enrollment, but uh, also there's a question this morning about, you know, uh, attitudes, which we really, we don't have much data on attitudes and motivation. Uh, although there are some, uh, I think, but uh, not enough data. So, in fact, we're trying to infer reasons for, for the, what we see in the statistics, in the data, as to the reasons why, you know, enrollments are lower for boys and so on. So I think, uh, and with regard to the sort of clamor on, you know, improving data, maybe we can also uh, add to that the uh, data on motivation, on attitudes, okay, that actually, um, that is the, the reasons behind certain behavior of, of families uh, for households or uh, students. Thank you very much. I, 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 I agree with uh, uh, what you're saying about uh, uh, the, the opportunity cost for, for boys would be higher. Um, than the girls, so you know, uh, and uh, you can use that as one of the the reason actually for why you want to subsidize. Um, if you want to give a higher, um, what you call this higher uh, grant to the family, tied a little bit of that to boys. Uh, as far as I can recall, we have anti-child labor policies, right? And uh, it would not be a good idea to, uh, well, it's, it can be observed, but then maybe in the, there's, I don't know if it was, if it's still uh, being implemented, but then the, uh, you can use that as a statistical vehicle, the child labor survey, something like that, to try to understand the motivations, the attitudes of those who decided to leave school. So in a way, when you try to analyze child labor outcomes, for instance, the for you to come up with an estimate of the opportunity cost, it will be clear. So the, the mapping from attitudes and motivations to specific labor outcomes may be easily established if you use the particular data set as a vehicle. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, are there any more questions or comments? Okay, one last question. It's a comment on the CCT. Uh, it's uh, our program at the DSWD. A uh, young lady, yes, it's only for three children, but they do not choose. It's the first three children. Whether babae or lalaki, doesn't matter. It has to be the three children. Um, because the primary objective of the CCT is motivating the parents for them to go to school and to discourage dropouts and child labor. Therefore, whether babae, lalaki, it doesn't matter. It's to, wala, walang gender choices. So kung may suggestion na bigyan ng higher, uh, baka medyo lilihis ng konti sa policy to encourage um, the parents to send their children to school and to stop nga the intergenerational uh, prop of poverty wherein the parents most of the parents are not uh, was not able to finish uh, or have very low educational attainment and with the CCT program we are encouraging the parents that to give the opportunity for the children to be able to finish school para wala nang ano uh, sila mas higher na yung magiging aim nila compared to their parents I'm actually surprised that the rules were changed because uh, I know uh, that uh, uh, you have you, the 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 parents. I mean, before uh, can can really choose which ones to include in the list. But maybe uh, maybe I'm out of date already. Uh, that that has been, been changed. But I know that previously that was your right. Now. 
Um, the um, one thing that uh, talking about attitudes and so on. One of the things that uh, maybe uh, would, would be interesting to to share with you is that um, <clears throat> we uh, in the third round of the impact evaluation that we are doing for this WD bank etc. is that we have measures of attitudes like grit and control, feeling of control of decisions. So, and grit we included there because the literature is increasingly pointing to the critical importance of these social emotional skills and one of them is grit or persistence, so on. And <clears throat> beautiful thing about the result is that conditional cash transfers, the four Ps, actually do have a significant, a substantial impact on raising the index of grit. Now, the question is, what in the CCT, of, you know, there are various activities, it has FDS, it has blah, 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 etc. What has caused that? We don't know yet. But the CCT, and this is one of its really good, positive uh, impact to take note of, is that um, it is contributing to the development of um, Grit or good socioeconomic skills that one are what that's one of the key factors for future success. So uh, I just want to mention that because indeed we need to uh, and, and we hope in the fourth round of the impact evaluation we could expand some more the research in that area so we'll have a better understanding and we know how to take advantage of the strength of the program. Well, I'm afraid we no longer have uh, time left uh, for the open forum. So please join me in thanking our uh, two speakers for their uh, enlightening presentations. Lots of takeaways that uh, we can get from uh, this um, this seminar. We have seen that uh, there's still, while we are uh, successful in uh, closing the gender gender gap no well at, there's still a lot to be a lot of things that still need to be done uh particularly in um, what we um seen this this afternoon in um, improving the um, participation of boys the school performance of boys as well as in addressing the uh still persistent marginalization of of women in terms of labor force participation and in terms of uh, uh, the valorization of their work and contribution to society. And we can, you know, these are deeply rooted in our in traditional gender roles between men and women, which, and also um, mga, um, stereotypes, no? gender stereotypes, which are deeply rooted in our country. <coughs> But, kahit na marami pa tayong gagawin, at least we still continue to do our work and we still um, continue to, uh, um, you know, work together, contribute. And uh, at PIDS, this is our uh, small contribution to ongoing um, efforts no, to really fully close the gap between, uh, you know, uh, close the gender gap and um, achieve a really inclusive society. So with that, I close this session and I now give the floor to our MC. Thank you to the active participation of our participants and to our speakers for their uh, comprehensive responses. But before I give the floor to our last speaker, may I remind you once again to please fill up the evaluation form given to you earlier. 
we will collect them after the event. So now to close our activities, activity, may we hear from Dr. Connie, the Quaker. Uh, this is just going to be short. So, pasasalamat lang po uh, for coming here today and share your time, uh, your experiences, your insights, uh, your expertise. You know, po siguro. Um, there are so many things that we have learned today, as Sheila had already uh, mentioned. Marami po tayong natutunan, but uh, still, we should not stop there. Uh, there are so many things that, that still need to be done, and we hope that we have uh, inspired in you. Uh, sparked some some interest in doing and mainstreaming uh, God, gender, and development into your work and into your daily lives. Maraming salamat po and happy, uh, happy Women's Month. Thank you. So that ends our activity today. Once again, we'd like to thank everyone for being with us and we hope to see you in our future activities. Kindly submit the evaluation form to the secretary outside or you may leave them on the table. We'll collect them later. Thank you.